Last year, an amateur archaeologist was walking through these woods when he came across a load of lumps and bumps, and they were very lumpy and bumpy. He was told that this site played a crucial role in the defence of this island during the Second World War, and he realised that it needed to be looked at before it was lost forever. So he talked to Time Team about it, and they said that no one has ever dug a site like this before, because although this is British soil, these defences aren't British. They're German, part of the vast complex of defences built by Hitler to turn Jersey into an island fortress. Oh, and by the way, that amateur archaeologist was me. So I'm going to be under quite a lot of pressure over the next few days. I wonder how long before the archaeologists stop talking to me. In the early summer of 1940, the Channel Islands became the only part of the British Isles to be invaded and occupied by the advancing forces of Hitler's Blitzkrieg. For the islanders, it was the beginning of five years of the cold reality of life under hostile occupying forces. And even now, 70 years later, the islands are littered with the remains of that occupation. During the occupation period, 40 to 45, we're talking about some 65,000 plus mines being laid in the island and probably over 26,000 tonnes of other munitions. And it means for the next three days, our archaeologists are going to have to be rather careful when it comes to any small finds they uncover. This is a 75. If you happen to uh, tap one with your trowel, I suggest you uh, stop tapping it and basically <laughs> make your way away from it. So, are you still happy to go ahead with this? I think I feel slightly more cautious about it, I think. <laughs> so, with the briefing over, it's time to get our first trench in. They say, don't hit it hard, and then the first thing you do is you go... And it's essential we're vigilant, because our site at Les Gillettes is a heavily fortified German anti-aircraft battery that overlooked the airport and dominated the surrounding landscape. Now hidden under a canopy of trees, this rare wartime RAF reconnaissance photograph shows the site in its prime, and it suggests it once dripped with heavy artillery. Over the next three days, we want to translate this grainy image into a three-dimensional recreation of that fortress. We're seeing a lot more than on that air photo, yeah. Yeah. which must be yeah. a real testament to the German camouflage guys. And we've assembled our own army of experts to decipher all these lumps and bumps. Dr Jilly Carr, who's pioneered the archaeology of the occupation. If you look around the airfield in particular... The military historian Andy Robertshaw. We need to know what, what those are and if they are. And Martin Brown, a Ministry of Defence archaeologist. It looks like a weapons pit, doesn't it? And it's the right size to put one of the 20 mil in rather than one of the big 88s, yeah. OK. But for me, it's a lot more than just learning about the position of flak guns. It's about the archaeology of the only successful invasion and occupation of Britain since 1066. It really is true that from the first moment I came into this forest, it started to work its magic on me. And I think that's probably something to do with the fact Jersey was successfully occupied. And it gives me an eerie feeling of what it might have been like if the mainland had been occupied by the Germans as well. But whatever it was, it made me feel that I wanted our team to be the people who excavated here. So that's the emotional stuff out of the way, but prosaically, you've got to dig it now. I mean, the point is about sites like this, we don't have any complete wartime plans of it. And just sort of looking around this morning, there's an awful lot going on here. The Channel Island Occupation Society, since 1977, has been excavating or uncovering German bunkers. But what we're looking at here, there's different sorts of fortifications. So this kind of excavation, excavation that we're doing here is completely new. What we want to have a look at is the entire layout of the base, the ordinary gun pits, the machine gun nests, the, the, the slit trenches, the whole layout of the camp. And this is real cutting-edge archaeology. It really is. I mean, this was meant to be one of the open areas they thought we could look at, but, uh, I mean, it's just a non-starter. 
Unfortunately, not everyone is quite so enthusiastic about my choice of site. I don't know what we're going to do. So, with Geofiz somewhat kiboshed by the vegetation, we're going for the old-fashioned approach. Our first trench over a possible gun emplacement has gone in based on the aerial photograph and Stuart's surveying skills. And he's already given us a position for a second trench. There's a whole series of structures here that look as if they're buildings associated with the emplacement that Phil's working on. And this might be where the crews look after the gun, as it were. This is where people might actually be living. We're not expecting anything big and concrete. It's not a bunker type of building. It might even be just a timber building. The which... way you're talking, you've actually got very excited about this site. I love you? it. It's like just wandering into woodland and suddenly finding all these things above ground. But if you've got that aerial photograph, do we actually need to do a great deal of archaeology? Well, we do, because this was taken in 1944. They could have put all sorts of other things here which wouldn't even be on this aerial photograph. In spite of being only 70 years old, we haven't been able to find any written records for this site. They were probably destroyed by the Germans before they surrendered. But looking at a battery that was similar to ours, it's obvious there was a lot going on. Is this our site? Uh, no, it isn't. It's a similar position on the other side of the island. It says here 3 slash 156 FLAC. What does FLAC actually mean? FLAC is an abbreviation for the, the German full term, which is Flieger aber Kanonen. Anti aircraft gun is what it means. That's all it means. Simple as that. If we go into 3D, we've got our anti aircraft guns, in this case, 588s. There's a couple of 2 centimetre anti aircraft for close defence. But it's not just a defensive structure. It's where up to 200 soldiers are living, eating, drinking, going to the toilet, you know, having recreation. It's actually community. Brian, Martin, what you got? It looks like it's about three or four inches long. <laughs> and, 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 and sort of 20 millimetres in and, diameter. And about 20 millimetres in diameter. And back up in trench one, Phil's just turned up the sort of small find that suggests we're right in the middle of all that flak. Rule one was call you. Rule two was don't tamper with it. You've got a prize, I think. Is it? Yes, it's a two-centimetre shell case. Is it going to go bang? It's not likely to go bang, but it does contain explosive propellant and a primer. <laughs> this is our first trench, our first <laughs> slice out of it, and already we've discovered something which could blow up in our faces. This could be a great dig, or it could be really frustrating. Fingers crossed. And you brought us here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sobering discovery. We really will have to be careful over the next couple of days. Oh. I think you've got it precisely what we had before. But these 20 millimetre diameter shells do suggest that Trench 1 is the site of a 20 mil anti-aircraft gun. And this gun would have been just one of thousands of German weapons that swamped Jersey from 1940 onwards. The Channel Islands had become a bit of an obsession for Hitler. It was the only British land he controlled, and he threw troops and defences at it out of all proportion to the population. In France, there was roughly one German soldier to every 100 Frenchmen. In Jersey, it was one German to every three islanders. The propaganda opportunities for the Nazis were obvious. But for our historian, there are also clear parallels with the ancient world. This is the story that I see written through the whole of human civilization. If you go centuries back or thousands of years back, you have the same thing. You have one megalomaniac individual and everybody else falling in line behind him to take over someone else's territories. Is it just me, or do you find looking at this footage very chilling? It's very sobering. This is a propaganda film, so it's almost a pastiche of itself. And there, there is the Bobby directing the, the traffic. The Bobby, scene. exactly. And then there's a you know the flower bed with a swastika in it. But but that was the point really. This was the Nazis saying we have occupied this place and this is an ideal invasion. Did Jersey know it was going to be invaded? Well, it wasn't clear at all, um, because as late as March, you've got the Home Office and the Foreign Office saying things like, you know, Jersey, it's an ideal destination for a family holiday, you know. Take, take your families there. 
And, and I think that's the real issue, that the islanders have no idea what's going on. What happens is that the island is demilitarised and the islanders begin to hear about this on the 19th of June. So that means that the, all the troops go, uh, the telephone cables are cut. So the Germans drop these terms of surrender on the 1st of July onto the airfield, saying that, you know, as long as the islanders are peaceful, then they'll get their liberty. Um, and they have to put up white flags to show that they accept this. And then people put up old vests and pillowcases outside their houses to show that they're not going to put up resistance. Um, I'll tell you what is really interesting for me, though, about this, is because if you work with the ancient past, of course, you haven't got any of the testimonies of the victims. You, you hear from the conqueror's point of view. Whereas here, of course, there are a thousand or so people living who remember all of this. I was in the garden at home, and I heard planes coming, and you didn't see many planes, so you looked to see what it was. And there were the swastikas under the wings, and then they dropped two bombs and I saw the bombs falling and shot inside like a squared rabbit. <laughs> Bethany is in her element. <laughs> talking to people who witnessed world-changing events at first hand. One officer had his hat knocked off by some youths and some of those were caught and, oh yes, they were punished very severely. Some went to real concentration camps, prison camps, on the continent, and some did not come back. But although we've got shed loads of historical and first-hand evidence of the occupation, our once heavily guarded site is still managing to keep its secrets from us. Well, we have the platform for it, but no evidence for the building, which I guess might have been quite ephemeral light structure. We've also now opened two more trenches, this time over strange features that John's managed to identify from his severely curtailed geophys. Ah, lovely. And one of them has just thrown up a find that's got us completely stumped. Wondered whether it was part of a sealed kitchen, but that's not going to work for filling it full of uh, soup, is it? So It looks too fragile for something like a gun mounting, doesn't it? Doesn't it just? Well, there's our first mystery on this site. We yeah. have two days now, left to find out what that is. And people say, why do you bother digging it? You know what everything is. But we have sorted out trench one. Yeah. It's not just a bank that's thrown up to go round a gun. The defense... As Phil's discovered that the defences built on this hillside were engineered to last. What we seem to get is this, this inner stone-built revetment, and then we've got this fine-grained material pushed against the outside of it to make the actual bank. I mean, that makes complete sense. You don't want enemy shell fire or bullets striking stones. So you put the soft stuff out there and that will absorb the energy of incoming um, ammunition from the enemy. From the, the invention of gunpowder onwards, that's the way you do it. We were actually getting quite a few fines as well. I don't know whether you, they may mean anything to you. I like the look of that. <laughs> I really, really do. If you're going to build a position like this, you're going to use revetting stakes, pieces of timber that you hammer into the ground. But if you put that and then put your wall against it, it just caves in. If you take a loop of cable or a loop of wire, loop it round your, your upright, right. take it out there, hammer in a stake, put a piece of wood between the middle of it and turn it round, it actually windlasses the whole thing in and pulls it in tight and it acts as a straining wire, taking the weight of all of the structure outside. So our first trench can confirm that this earthwork is a 20mm gun emplacement and it was strategically placed to shoot down low-flying aircraft. Phil's emplacement up on the top here, on the highest point, that's a 20mm gun. That's designed to be quick moving, it's got a rapid rate of fire. And as we know this shape is a 20mm gun, we can confidently say that all these features are also 20mm guns which isn't a bad result for one day's digging. But as Stewart's discovered, they were just part of a sophisticated setup to defend the airfield and the island against Allied attack. The 88s, the bigger ones on this side of the hill, they've got a dual purpose. They've, they've got a 360 degree arc on the sky. You shoot anything up in the sky, as it were. But they're also able to depress their barrels downwards so they can cover all that area by the airport and they can actually see right down to the bay at the south. These larger 88mm gun pits will be our main target for tomorrow 
as we begin to extend our investigation, because it's now clear that this whole hillside operated as one big settlement. And it is that wider landscape that's starting to prove really interesting. If you come round the back of Phil's trench, you can see here we've just started to bring up this cache of small German finds. But this one is my favourite at the moment. It really is rather curious. It looks like a German medal, but in fact it's a fake German medal. I'm relieved to say this site is starting to be really quite intriguing. It's the start of day two in Les Gillette, Jersey. Right, I think we've got another, another bullet there. Oh, yeah. And we're beginning to get used to finding ammunition in our trenches. That's another one of these German 7.92 cases. It's uh, the standard small arms ammunition. It's not surprising, really, as we're trying to piece together the complex layout of this World War II German anti-aircraft battery. By the end of yesterday, we'd made our first breakthrough. And we now know what this earthwork was all about. It was the site of a 20 millimetre anti-aircraft gun. So far, so good. But today, we're going after the big stuff. Because if the 20 millimetre emplacements on this site were like the muskets of anti-aircraft warfare, then it's these massive enclosures housing 88 millimetre guns that were the cannons. That's what an 88mm looks like with its crew. It's got an eight-man crew, it sits on a big tripod. You need something about 12 metres wide. And this is an incredibly powerful gun. If, if, if we had a gun here, you see the, the contrails in the sky, people going on their holidays? Yeah. And they're at 20,000 feet, thereabouts. This gun would bring that down. Wow. That's an incredible gun, is that? Where are we going to put the trench? We're actually going to excavate this quadrant here. It's quite chunky, so we're going to get the mini digger in. We actually want to see if we can find the tripod placement, which should be in the middle, just here. So our next trench goes in over this potential 88mm gun emplacement, one of six we suspect once sat on this hillside. And they'd have been the main focal points for the 200-plus troops that ate, slept and lived in a state of permanent readiness on this fortified settlement. Including the area where we put in Trench 2 yesterday. So what do you think they're using this bit for? Well, the big clue was what's in that tray there. Which looks like paint tubes. So it's not paint, it's actually toothpaste. And with it, we've got this, which is a case from a razor, and down there, we've got a drain, draining away water. So this is an ablutions block. And these guys are getting up in the morning, they're coming down here, getting cleaned up, going to get their breakfast, do their duty, and it all has to be done in an organised way. Actually, that's also what the islanders all say. They say that they notice Germans are incredibly regular in everything they do. So, you know, they get up at the same time, they'll go to the shops at the same time, they'll clean their teeth at the same time, they'll have their pint at the same hour of the day. So we've now established another feature on our site and more evidence that the Germans saw the occupation of Jersey as a long-term investment. Oh, I found a coin. Ooh. Oh, blimey. But we're also discovering that having an occupying force control day-to-day -day life can lead to all sorts of unforeseen complications. Well, it says 1924 here, so this actually would have dated some way before the occupation, back to the Weimar Republic. And what's interesting about this is that there were actually as many as five different types of currency that circulated during the occupation. It all got a bit complicated. Um, there were both these coins, which dated to before the occupation. There were occupation Reichsmarks, but there was also Jersey coins that were circulating, and British coins, and even some old French coins that sort of entered circulation a little bit. So a lot of things going on. So far, we've only been digging about a third of this battery, and Stuart feels it's about time to investigate another target at the other end of the site. You know, from other flat batteries, you know what to expect. There's a guns, and then there has to be a, a fire and command control centre close to the guns, and sometimes have a shelter for the crew underneath, like a bunker or something like that. Not necessarily concrete, could be dug down into yeah. the rock or the earth. Well, I mean, the results don't necessarily suggest concrete bunker but certainly something that's going deep into the ground and appears to have 
collapsed and be full of rubble. Mm. We need a trench across that anomaly, don't we? I mean, there's mm. no question about it. Very, very interesting. Well, we've already marked it. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> using powers of prediction, that's fantastic. <laughs> That's hard ground, isn't it? So we're opening a new trench over a potential bunker. And very quickly, it becomes clear there's something rather interesting deep down. Look, it's red here. There's some tile. All oh, right, it's a tile. Or brick. Or something. You're lying too. And if we can work out what it is, it'll help us build a picture of this hillside 70 years ago. Using all the cutting edge technology we have at our fingertips. There's tens of thousands of pounds worth of computers in here for the graphics, the geophers, the GPS. It's our technological epicenter. And over here is a grown man in a sand pit. Stuart, what are you mucking about at? <laughs> I don't think I've ever been described as being a grown man before, Tony. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is build up a model of this flat battery up on top of this hill. And what we know at the moment is we've got a 20 millimetre gun battery and we've got the blast bank around what appears to be a building down here. By the time we've finished, we'll be able to plop all the buildings, all the trenches, all the earthworks and get a full impression of this site without that woodland that's there today. The only one thing that's really obvious to me here is that we've got all this war apparatus around this bit and you've got a load here as well. Mm. But here, in the middle, you've got, what is that, a field of hay? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? Because there's a shortage of food on the island, gun batteries actually had to have their own farms inside them to grow potatoes, to grow hay, because they used horses a lot to uh, transport things around. They're actually acting as farmers uh, as well as gunners. One more question. What did you do to your finger? <laughs> First casualty, I'm afraid. It's got a lot to do with that. <laughs> Landscape surveying is obviously more dangerous than I thought. As the archaeologists continue to grapple with the big stuff, the small finds are starting to bring this site to life. This tray is stuff connected with the occupation. It doesn't look like much, but that's the fastener from one of the ammunition boxes that would have serviced the 20 mil cannons. Uh, this is the one that had us all in, intrigued yesterday. It seems to be like the replica of a medal. Well, I had a word with one of the local collectors last night, and he produced this. Oh, this yeah. is a war merit badge, second class, with swords. And I think they're obviously trying to have, make a little homemade version of that here. I love the idea of a trenches gag, don't you? Oh, yeah, I mean, are they sitting up here, awarding each other huge decorations? You ought to, you ought to Iron Cross first class. And it's probably something conscripts posted a long way from home have done since the beginning of time. Back in Rakshar's trench, a morning's industrial pruning has now revealed that we do have the sight of an 88mm gun. Can you see these metal bolts coming through here? Oh, yeah. I've also got this circular feature as well. I'm wondering whether this is actually the gun placement. I think you're onto something there. We're, we're... And it's becoming clear that the gun was at the centre of a substantial piece of engineering. At the moment, what we've got uncovered is, what, about a third of it, something like it's that? It's about a third, cos you can see the bank coming down that side. It's actually really massive and just it coming through there, so I think we are pretty much in the middle. I reckon, then, what we need to do is try and extend this and get at least a half of it open, then that gives us some understanding of, of how the whole thing would have been laid out. Great, better carry on, then. A bit more digging. Slowly but surely, we're getting a sense of the force once stationed here. In fact, it's turning out to be a rather enjoyable journey of discovery. And then we discover the last thing we need. Ian, I think that's perhaps where we stop, because I think we've got some form of ordinance going on. And this time, it's not a stray bullet. Right here, right behind it, Faye. It looks like a very real, very live artillery shell. Hi, it's Faye here. Um, is anyone around to come and have a look at some potential ordnance in my trench, please? We'll get someone over. Brilliant, thank you. Not very happy about this. 
I don't want to get too close, actually, funnily enough. Strange. Um, it's the afternoon of day two at our German anti-aircraft gun emplacement in Jersey. Share this with me. And it looks like we've just found a very unwelcome reminder of what this site was all about. Well, it's definitely the base of a shell case. Uh, it's almost certainly an 88. What I don't know at the moment is whether it's uh, the actual case is alive and whether there's a, a shell at the end of it, which is the more hazardous part of the item. The whole reason Faye's been digging this trench is to investigate some of the structures on this fortified hillside, because we're discovering that although the anti-aircraft guns were at the heart of this site, they didn't exist in isolation. The communication cable comes from here. And Phil's now uncovered evidence that the gun crews were being coordinated by central command units. If we got the cables coming in here and actually skirting past, could they be coming to that 88 up there? Well, that'd be the most logical. There's nothing in between, is there? And Stuart now believes he's found the location of one of these control centres. We're looking at something sticking out to about this distance. At the moment, this, uh, on the balance of evidence, is the best candidate we've seen for a command and control centre. It's the, it's the biggest complex on the site. It's central to all the anti-aircraft batteries and so on. This would be a perfect target for a trench, except for one small detail, the best spuds in the world. Shame yeah. it's under potatoes, eh? <laughs> So in this case, it's Jersey Royals 1, time team nil. This material here might very well be propellant. So we, still, we are talking about quite a long case. OK. And potentially then unfired or fired? Definitely unfired. Back at Faye's trench, we're now ready to lift our unwelcome find. Oh, my gosh. Oh. OK, what's that? It is 88, but it's what they call a drill round, and they would use it for practice and drill in for, in, on the, in when they're firing the guns. So it's not dangerous? No. Ah, oh, that's a really... <laughs> I think this may need further investigation. But we've finally got to admit that one of our other discoveries will have to remain a mystery. Yesterday we found this buried about five foot down and no one knew what it was. So everyone rushed back to their military textbooks last night and we still have no idea what it is, have we? If this was Roman, we'd say it was probably ritual. Oh, of course we would, yeah. Mind you, we don't have to know what every single find is, do we? It's going to have to remain a mystery. It's not the only mystery in this section because that hole there, we didn't just dig that in order to extricate that funnel thing, did we? This would have been here in the Second World War. Why? Well, what it is, you've got the anti-aircraft positions up here doing their job. Yeah. And the Germans are worried that they're actually going to be a target for the British. So you put an infantry perimeter around as well. And actually, if you hop down in... Yeah. Right, down into here. Yep. Yeah. That's right. If you look that way, I mean, if we cut, that, cut the bushes out, yeah. you've got a gap. In the hedge bank, you can see through there, yeah. and your Fritz in your foxhole, waiting to see whether those British troops are going to be coming across to try and do damage to this gun battery. There is one slight design flaw, isn't there? It's very difficult to get out of. Oh, yes. Having established that this is a foxhole, we can see there's a whole network of them around the edge of the site, or infantry perimeter in military lingo. And this is only one line of defence. There are all sorts of other fortifications. We've seen that domed shelter before. There's a number of them round with the guns, aren't they? Not one no. coming in at an angle like that, and certainly not with this big earthwork. This is very different, isn't it? So we're going to dig out this bunker to see if there's anything in it that could add to our story. And there are other defences that Stuart's now got his eye on that he thinks were dug very late in the war. These are defensive trenches for, to protect the battery itself. They're yeah. not just communication trenches. Well, the other thing about this trench is that we can actually date when it was constructed to some extent. Because right. this aerial photograph I've been using was taken in August 1944, yeah. as you know. The trench that we're looking at comes off at an angle, and you can see it's not shown at all on this, this photograph. And to dig through solid rock 
to achieve these trenches. I mean, that's just incredible. They must have been seriously concerned that invasion was a real possibility. Mm. These rock-cut trenches would appear to show the determination of the German troops here to defend their positions against Allied attack. But there could be a chance that the soldiers didn't do the digging themselves because our site overlooks the most impressive and most chilling monument to the German occupation. About 100 feet above my head, Phil and the rest of the team are excavating our German anti-aircraft battery. But down here, there's a much more tangible example of the German occupation. This is the Jersey War Tunnels, originally created as an artillery workshop and military hospital for the Germans. But if ever there's a statement that says, we're powerful, we're here, and we're not going away, this is it. The war tunnels now house a museum chronicling the five increasingly desperate years of the occupation. Hewn out of solid rock, the tunnels are a testament to German engineering. But they're also a testimonial to the brutal Nazi ethos that some people deserved to be treated as subhuman. There is something phenomenally bleak about that unfinished tunnel, isn't there? There is. It was built by people who worked for the organisation Tote. And these were voluntary labour, there's um, coerced labour, forced labour, slave labour. People from from Russia, from Poland, from Belarus, from Ukraine. People who in the, the Nazi racial hierarchy were right down there. Did many of them die? Yes, yes, hundreds in, uh, in Alderney and um, around about 100 in Jersey. How did the Jersey people feel about what was going on here? When you mention the slave labour here, it, it's almost as if these are memories that are unbearable. Um, so I've been talking to people, and you see the tears come to their eyes when they remember it, because, I mean, particularly, as Julie says, the, the Soviets particularly, they were incredibly badly treated here. Um, they were given no clothes, so they were either naked or in rags. Um, the food rations that were meant to be getting to them, for instance, milk was sent over to the hospital, and you find that the guards are just using it as whipped cream instead. So they were starving, um, they were beaten, many of them died. So, so it was truly atrocious. And that's why it's important to come here, because this, you know, it's a monument to the suffering of those slave workers, but it's also a reminder of the absolute horror of a war like this. One day, the neighbour came to the door and said, come and look, there's something terrible. We could see all these imported labourers who were brought in terrible state in rags. They looked ashen grey. And I thought, good God, the stories we've been hearing over our illegal radios are absolutely true. They were intermensch. They were subhuman, therefore you could treat them how you liked. It's a sobering reminder as we reach the end of day two that what we're digging had a real and lasting impact on the people of Jersey. Stuart, this turned up earlier. And we're still discovering yet more evidence of the force used to occupy this island. Well, it's an 88 shell case, that's for sure. Well, I think the, the actual gain for the, uh, the primer of the shell case is still present. So uh, it's potentially dangerous. And I think if you just continue taping it off and uh, we'll deal with it in due course. Disposing of it in due course basically means we're going to take it to a nearby beach tomorrow and blow it up. Back at the heart of the site, the scale of the gun emplacements that fired those shells is now evident. Moment of triumph. <laughs> so have you finished? Far from it, but I'll tell you what we do have at the moment. Yeah. We have this big, massive base plate, and that's where the gun would have sat on, but you can see these two holes in this circular dip here. They're actually for the, the cables for the gun. So what else for tomorrow, Ben? Well, what we've been doing is looking at the different types of earthwork, characterising them, you know, working out what they are. Tomorrow, what we want to do is try and put it all together and really sort of understand this complex as a whole. So even though it's just brambles and briars here now, by the end of tomorrow, you'll be able to give us a vivid picture of what life would have been like here in the 1940s. Absolutely. 
Beginning of day three here at Les Gillette, my little forest deep in the heart of Jersey, where we're trying to piece together the story of a World War II German anti-aircraft battery. And although we've done pretty well, we've only managed to identify four features so far, which is a bit worrying because we've only got one day left and I've got an awful lot of these cards still to put up. But the features we have identified, an ablution hut, a foxhole, and 20mm and 88mm gun emplacements have allowed Stuart to start identifying similar features in the 1944 aerial photograph. Another 88 emplacement here and another 88 there. And that, in turn, has given us other potential targets. So you should have a rangefinder. It's like a pair of binoculars, but the one lens is out there and one lens is out there to get the range of the aircraft as they come and send the instructions to the, to the big guns. But we're also picking up other archaeological features that suggest that as the war progressed, this fortified hillside was redeveloped. We've got a concrete crew shelter, but it's different to the other ones we see here because it's got an emplacement in front of it. So our final trenches go in over these intriguing features around the perimeter of the site. Oh, it'll be rubbish. <laughs> So, Faye, this looks like a big hole with a lot of demolition rubble pushed in the base of it. Over on the other side of the site, Faye, having recovered from her shell shock, is trying to resolve the mysterious potential bunker. So, at the back there, we've got what looks like a dividing wall or something, and then we've got all these cables coming in as well. And it was this trench that produced one of the weirdest-looking finds I've seen in a long time. Yesterday afternoon, our entire dig ground to a halt for a bit when we found this shell in amongst the archaeology, except that when our bomb disposal bloke looked at it, he said that it wasn't a shell like this. It was, in fact, a pretend shell, which was all a bit of an anticlimax, wasn't it? No, I think it's fantastic. We thought we'd find lots of these, the, the, the live ones, but this is a really rare. It's a practice shell. Why do you need to practice putting a big bullet in a big gun? Well, if it was just one person working, not a problem. But if you've got eight of you, you've got one guy opening the breach, another man putting the shell in, then the breach is closed. On the right-hand side, you've got men operating elevation and traverse, and the others running up one every four seconds with a new shell to fire. I think it was our Stuart who said that when you fire one of these things, it can bring down an aircraft thousands of feet away. Yeah. How... Does it manage to hit the aircraft so accurately? It doesn't. What it actually has is a timer set into the fuse at that end, and that's set electronically, and that predetermines when it'll explode. You don't actually try and make a hole in the aeroplane uh, and then go off bang. It goes off near the aeroplane, underneath it, above it, and it's the fragments that then do the damage. Once the war finished, there was a concerted effort to defuse and remove all the shells from the island. But even now, they do surface. Stuart, so this is the offending 88 that we've got to get rid of. It is indeed, Phil. We found one of our own yesterday, and apparently the best way to dispose of it is to blow it up. It's just not worth trying to open it up uh, manually uh, to try and preserve it. You're placing yourself at great risk doing that. The, the best thing to do is we'll put a little charge on this, this item, and then we're going to proceed down the beach, dig a hole, Ah, that's where I come in. <laughs> I wonder why I was invited and I wonder why I was given a shovel. I know now. <laughs> While Phil gets used to the idea of burying something as opposed to digging it up, Matt's now got to the bottom of his bunker. It's obvious it started off as an ammunition store for the 88mm gun Rakshar's digging. They've been really shifting some heavy stuff around. The scratch is going down there and down there. Ammunition boxes, things like that, perhaps? Yeah, I guess so. But the defences thrown up around it suggest that it changed use as the war progressed. That looks a bit like a firing step there. Well, that's what we think. Um, this one's different to all these other shelters in that it's got that out there. Now, if you, if you look through, actually what you've got is a field of fire down that trench system and covering that area out in the woodland beyond. So it makes sense to have a sort of secondary defence line here. Defending this hill from a land-based attack appears to have become more important in the latter years of the war. And we're now confident another one of our trenches is also part of this re-fortification. It's 
a machine gun post. Heck of a lot of hard work. You can see it was cut out of the solid rock. And it's part of the network of defences that we can see pretty clearly on the 1944 aerial photo. But intriguingly, we're starting to find things that aren't on that photo, like this big structure behind you, Martin. What is it? Right, well, it begins life. You can see it on there. It's the same sort of position as that first trench still did. But they've dished in one side of it here to create this big bank there. So it's stopped being about anti-aircraft defence and actually it's become part of this system and it's providing extra fire support for the guys who are down there in your machine gun. So it's a shifting from attack to defence? Quite right, yes. How does that tie in with history? Well, this photo was taken in August, I think, 1944. And if you think June 1944, everything has changed because you've had the Allied landings in Normandy. So suddenly the Allies, they're, they're only 40 miles away in France. So it's a completely different game they're suddenly having to play here. They are now cut off not just from Britain, they're also cut off from France. So the irony is that the Germans here, who were the besiegers, had now suddenly become the besieged. Completely. So, so we always think of D-Day as this big moment when the war turned, but things just got worse for everybody here. After D-Day, the Germans dug in, preparing for an imminent Allied invasion. But the Channel Islands were so heavily fortified that Churchill decided that any attack would result in unacceptable losses. In fact, the island wasn't liberated until the day after VE Day in May 1945. And the long, harsh winter of 1944 was the lowest point in the island's occupation. And the small finds we've uncovered in Phase Trench helped paint a picture of the final starving months of German rule. You can still make out some of the lettering on this particular one, and you can, I think it says New Zealand, and a little bit of the anchor. I reckon this is, this is New Zealand anchor butter. It is. And this... That's completely recognisable. It is. It's yeah, butter, isn't it? and what, what I think this is, I wonder if this came in one of the Red Cross parcels from the Red, ship, Red Cross ship, the Vega, came in December 1944, and every month thereafter, it pretty much saved the islanders from starvation. And how are the Germans getting it? Because it wasn't intended for the Germans. No, the Germans did not get any parcels at all but some islanders felt sorry for the Germans and shared their food with them. Uh, yeah, I've read that. Um, there's an account of this particular family that when the food packages arrive, the first thing they do is they invite in the local Germans and they give them a cup of tea and a, and a square of Cadbury's chocolate. Really? I mean, it seems so generous, doesn't it, given yes. the situation? Yes. Now we're ready. Firing! One, two, three! <laughs> Ooh, that's amazing. Well, it was a complete success because of your digging. It was it, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so with our shells successfully disposed of, we can now concentrate on working out what we've actually uncovered on site. And it's clear that by the end of the war, the Germans had built a sophisticated complex of trenches against ground attack. I can't believe how big this thing is. Meanwhile, Rakshar and Phil, fresh from the beach, have revealed an 88mm emplacement as robust as any Roman archaeology we've ever uncovered. We've got that little bunker area over there. We can actually see now where all the timber revetment is. But the main thing is, this is a seriously big piece of engineering for a seriously big gun. While over in Phase Trench, we've also got something equally robust. But this time, it's underground. Well, down at the bottom now, we've actually got the base of this structure. And what we think we've got, you see the depth of it, is some from a bunker. And we've got all these cables and wires coming in. So I think we've got a communication bunker. Could this be the brains of the whole operation? I don't think it's big enough to be the brains of the whole operation, but potentially some of it, yes. This building here, is a command and control centre. That's where phase dig in. Yes, right in that trench us, that down trench. there, yeah. yeah. So, with all this information, what does our man in the sand pit think? Because we've excavated around 20 millimetre battery, you know what that's like, we can see others on the aerial photograph. Yep. And we've got a number of them ringing around the site. The 88 millimetre ones are square. They're very different to the 20 yep. millimetre ones. There's a, a nice triangular pattern of three there. Yeah. And over in where we're standing, nice triangle geometric pattern. So you can imagine, if they're firing, 
at 15 rounds a minute, that's 45 rounds from each of these batteries a minute, times two, 90 rounds a minute, these batteries can pump up into the sky. That's serious, that's serious air defence, is that? But you can see how they just went from being an anti-aircraft battery suddenly to having to think almost in infantry mode. This is the weakest side, they're expecting attacks up here, and you can see they're also, in this trench system, they're digging a trench along the back of the hedge line now, and they're going to use the hedge and the bank underneath it as part of the defences against any attack here. It, it's not just anti-aircraft. It's about controlling the airfield, and it's an anti-invasion defence at the same time. So we've got a fortified enclosure as sophisticated as any Iron Age hill fort, with six massive guns capable of throwing up a barrage of exploding shells, while 20 millimetre gun emplacements dealt with lower flying aircraft. But by the end, it was a fortress where starving troops lived in fear of invasion, and the 88 millimetre guns, including the one in Phil's trench, were now lowered to overlook the island below. Well, basically, we've got a sort of a, what I like to think of a, as a cross between a Roman fort and a, and a wooden box. The Roman fort bit is the bank that goes all the way around. That gives you your protection. The wooden box bit is the fact that all these edges would have been revetted with timber. And in fact, when you'd have come in here, you'd have seen wooden sides and wooden flooring, and in each corner you'd have had an ammunition box there and an ammunition box there and probably one over there. But the central part is really what strikes you. It is an enormous hole that is filled up with concrete. Yeah, and right in the middle of it, there's the one thing that's missing, which is that enormous metal killing machine. Absolutely. But you can just see the imprint of where it once stood. You've got these bolts here where it's actually been fixed to the concrete. And clearly, at the end of the war, they cut them all off except one, and then they lifted the gun away and, thank God, took it away. Yeah, glad it's not here anymore. Trying to transform the food at one of the UK's biggest cinema chains, Heston's Mission Impossible, on Tuesday at 9. But back to tonight, and Erin takes a hazardous journey into Gaza in the concluding part of The Promise. <laughs>